Well, hey, it's Dr. Phil. You're on Fill in the Blanks. And today we're talking about fraud. And I'm doing this because there is so much going on right now. Maybe it's because we're opening back up and people are getting more active, but there's so much happening right now that I'm getting so much interest from people about scams and frauds and cons. And you've seen it on Netflix with the making of Anna. And I interviewed Anna Delvey last week. So that'll be on Dr. Phil soon. You'll hear what's going on with all of that. But I want to talk today about who are these scammers? Who are these con men? And I'm not talking just about the catfish that we deal with here. Why do they do what they do? What do they do? All of those sorts of things. And understand there are different kinds of currency that motivate con men and fraudsters. Different kind of payoff. Some people obviously do it for the money. Some do it for attention, do it for fame. Maybe they do it for sympathy. But there are different kinds of currency. We're talking about the confidence man, the con man, the scams that they run. And there are internet scams, there are mail scams, there are phone scams. But I promise you, before the end of this month, some scammer, some con man is going to intersect with you in your life one way or another. And so I want to talk about how to spot these things, what the red flags are, so you don't become part of this multi-billion dollar industry. I want to talk to you about how you can stay safe online, how you can ensure you aren't the next victim. I have some great expert lawyers with me today, Tracy Siska, Laura McNeil, Steve Greenberg, and Xavier Pope, who I will introduce more thoroughly in just a minute. But let me set the stage first. Because when we talk about con men, I mean, who are we talking about? Are we talking about just straight up criminals, psychopaths, sociopaths that are just evil people that were just born to exploit other people? Or are we talking about good people that do bad things? Or are we just talking about bad people that just were born to just exploit others and be evil? And The fact of the matter is, it's both. There are good people that wind up exploiting others, cheating others, conning others, and defrauding others. And let me tell you how they get caught up in that. There's been a lot of research about this, actually. There have been a lot of case studies. There have been surveys and group studies about how people that have spent their whole lives getting educated, working regular jobs, being contributing members of society that wind up being con men, scam artists. How do they get there? How do they come to that point in their lives? And I'm going to tell you how they get there. They get there a little step at a time. They're not sociopaths. They're not psychopaths. They weren't born without a moral compass. What they do is they start out fudging something a little bit. Maybe they're getting a bank loan and they think, well, you know what? We're not going to quite qualify for this. So they just inflate things a little bit. Like maybe they say, okay, we've got to have some assets here. We're going to have to pledge our cars or a second home we have or something, and it's going to have to be worth a certain amount, and it's not quite there. Maybe it was one time, but it's not now, but let's put an old value on it where it was worth more then than it is now. And so they just write down that number that's maybe $25,000 more or 50 more, and their banker's a friend. He trusts them, so they don't go into it a whole lot. And it flies. They get the loan, and it's okay. So they go, well, you know, it was just a stroke of a pen. It worked out okay. And then so something else comes up pretty soon. And they say, how much equity do you have in your house? And you say, well, you know, I could add a little bit to that. Or, you know, how much debt do you have? Well, I could mark that down some. And then before they know it, They've got a whole web of deceit out there, and they've borrowed more than they can afford. They owe more than they can ever service, and so now they have to keep the ball rolling 
or it's going to hit a wall. So they go to a friend and say, hey, could you attest to this for me? Can you say you paid this? That you bought this for me? Can you say you're buying this house from me? Can you do this? And the person that does it doesn't think they're committing some big crime. They just think they're helping out a friend. Like, yeah, sure, you know, I'll help, I'll help you out. And then they get roped into it. And then pretty soon, this person now is defrauding a federal lending institution. And if anything ever comes crashing down, they're going to be in a whole lot of hurt. And then the government comes along and starts saying, you know what? You might qualify for this relief. We've had a pandemic here. We've had a downturn. If you do, 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 do. And people think, well, if I could just move a little bit, I just might get in there. You know, I did my master's thesis way back in 1976, and the title was Androgyny and Moral Judgment. And what we were looking at was whether or not men and women judged certain scenarios differently just based on whether they were men or women or not. I'll give you an example. Did it matter whether you would steal something from a garage sale versus a big corporation? A yard sale, garage sale, somebody on the corner. Was that a bigger infraction than something from a large corporation or the IRS, a big entity? Did men and women see that differently? Was their moral compass more sensitive based on sex? We would put people in different situations like, okay, I'm living in subsidized housing and my child wants to go to college. Well, I can't help them go to college unless I take a part-time job. But if I take a part-time job, I no longer qualify for subsidized housing. So I'm in a catch-22. If I take the job, that's enough money to help the child go to college. But then I lose the housing subsidy, so now I can't help them go to college. So the only way that I can help them is if I take the job but I don't report it. Well, is that an infraction? And if they decide to do that, do men or women judge that differently? There's all kinds of factors that go into whether people consider something crossing the line. So it's not just crooks, bad people, that choose to cross the line. And here's the big difference that research has shown us as to whether people will justify something or not. If you approach them and say, as you look at this, look at it either, is it best for the business or is this ethical? If they approach it in terms of what's best for the business, they're much more likely to cross the line than if you put a frame around it, ask yourself if this is ethical. Because what might be best for the business might not necessarily be ethical, and it matters how they enter into the decision-making. If you sensitize them to ethics in the very beginning, they're much less likely to cross the line than if you sensitize them to what's best for the business. So it all has to do with the mindset they use when they go into it. It also has to do with how you view the people that you're dealing with. Let me give you another example. You take your car in for emissions test, you know, whether or not it's emitting too much contamination, carbon, into the environment. Research has shown in a massive survey that if you go in with a big fancy car, BMW, Bentley, Mercedes, and you fail the test, 
the tester is not likely to let it slide. If you go in with a crummy car that's eight or 10 years old, which is much more like the one the tester at the gas station is likely to drive, the chance that they're going to let it slide if you fail the test is way higher than if you drive a fancy car. Why? They relate to you more. Hey, you're like me. If I fail this car, you got nothing to drive. If somebody failed my car, I would have nothing to drive. So people look at it a lot of times based on whether or not it relates to them or it relates to somebody that they might just have a little bit of resentment for. So I offer that just as an example that we tend to treat people differently if we relate to them or we don't. You remember I said there are different kinds of currency, and that motivates different kinds of con men and fraudsters. When I talk about Munchausen's, for example, which is now known as factitious disorder or factitious disorder imposed on someone else, this is when someone tries to get attention and sympathy by falsifying, inducing, or exaggerating an illness. They lie about their symptoms. They'll even sabotage medical tests by putting blood in their urine, or they'll harm themselves to create symptoms. It's often difficult to diagnose this because patient report is so important. So doctors, all they rely so much on what patients say. Now, they might be doing this because they're going to try to raise money in the community or set up a GoFundMe page if they've got a child with cancer or something. But a lot of times they're doing it for sympathy from family members or community members or whatever. So when I say there's a lot of kinds of currency, fraudsters aren't always just trying to get your money. They might just be trying to get you to give them sympathy, or they might be trying to get out of work, or they might just be trying to get people to bring them food and take care of them or give them free stuff. Who knows? But it's not always just that they're trying to con you out of your money. It might just be that they're trying to con you out of your emotions, your sympathies. So Just know that there are all kinds of cons that are going on. And of course, with the advent of the internet, boy, oh boy, are there lots of those sorts of scams going on. And we know that they always tend to target the elderly because they might be less situationally aware. But as you'll hear us talk about later, they're also starting to really con young people who are into these video games where they're trying to get points and bonuses inside video games, and they're creating these phony sites where they can buy them, they think, but they really can't. All they're trying to do is get those kids to give them their parents' credit card information, vital information that they can then use to go and buy goods and services for themselves using the parents' credit card information. So. It's like there's nowhere safe anymore. So they might be trying to defraud you on the phone, through the mail, and we're going to talk about red flags in just a moment. So let me tell you more about the expert panel of lawyers that I have with me today to talk about frauds and con men. I mentioned Tracy Siska. Tracy is the founder and executive director of the Chicago Justice Project. With a Master of Arts degree in criminal justice from the University of Illinois at Chicago, Tracy has nearly two decades of experience researching and working within the criminal justice system, and you can bet he has dealt with a lot of shady characters. Laura McNeil is a legal analyst and professor. She's been on Dr. Phil more than once. She teaches civil procedure, education law, and employment discrimination courses. She examines issues of access and equity and employment and education law with a particular emphasis on issues of access and equity for individuals from traditionally marginalized populations. Steve Greenberg is a criminal defense and civil rights litigator in Chicago. He's considered one of the top 10 for over 30 years and has been a go-to litigator for serious legal cases. Xavier Pope is the host of the podcast, Suit Up, 
and the principal owner of the Pope Law Firm, a boutique sports and entertainment law firm. And prior to starting his own law firm, Mr. Pope worked in Hollywood in the legal departments of leading entertainment companies. He actually has an interesting story and some history to tell with the Dr. Phil show that dates way back double-digit years, and we'll hear some about that. So listen in, because we're going to dig into the red flags of some of the scams, some of the ways to spot these things that you can share with your kids, with your parents, and put on your watch list, because I don't want you getting conned, scammed, and ripped off. So guys, thanks so much for being here today. I want to talk about these scams. I've been really focused lately on all of the fraud Of course, a lot of it is internet, but it's not all internet. A lot of it is focused on elderly people, of course, which has always been the case. But now I'm seeing it starting to focus on these kids in video games. But we're seeing these IRS frauds, social security frauds, stealing identities, and that sort of thing. And I know you guys have encountered these con men, these scam artists, I've dealt with them before. And what I always thought when these guys get caught is you would think that they would be like, oh my God, and kind of head hanging. But I've found them psychologically and interactively to be arrogant and belligerent. I mean, of course, you don't expect psychopaths to be remorseful, but these people, when they're caught, it's like, are you kidding me? What's been y'all's experience with these scammers and fraud artists, whether you're defending them or prosecuting them? What's been your experience of these people that run these scams on people? Steve, weigh in on this. Well, I I see it all the time in my practice that uh, people who are charged with fraud cases, and it's really uh, sort of the easy way and they're brazen. So with the internet, they can get information from anywhere. There are sites that people can go to on the dark web and buy people's personal information. And if it's a small time fraud, in other words, you're taking a little bit of money from a lot of people, very good chance you're not gonna get caught because there's just so much fraud that's going on. What I'm now starting to see is the fraud in the COVID loans that came down. When the government said to everyone, uh, look, you know, your business, we'll give you a business loan if your lost business is a result of COVID. You just have to provide some documentation that you had an employee and that your revenue went down, and then we'll forgive that loan. Well, I have people that I represent that went out and created fake corporations and got millions of dollars from the government. So when they say that the economy really is chugged along during COVID, so much of that, I think we're going to find out, is a result of these frauds. Laura, what do you think? I agree. I actually had graduate students that were engaging in the PP loan scandals. They were actually graduate students creating fake LLCs uh, that, you know, they have the law school training to do so and getting loans. And it was just astonishing to me that people have this false sense of anonymity because they feel like they're behind, you know, they're not actively out there doing it. They're doing it through the computers, through technology. Is it because they're stealing from the government, like a large corporation feeling instead of stealing from somebody personal? Is that what's making them think that it doesn't matter? Tracy? You know, I, I oddly enough, ages ago, I went to high school with two fraudsters and they both stole from banks and they both did it in the same way. As Steve said, stealing small amounts of money from multiple accounts. One got fired, went to another bank around the corner, did it again, got caught. They prosecuted him. The, sec- the second one, she did it. So- there was so much money involved that because she had done it for so many years, they actually prosecuted him. But what they did is they just fired these people. So they just keep going on to the next place, to the next place, to the next place. And as Steve and Laura said, I mean, the Internet just made this much worse and much easier to do a- around the country at-, at a moment's notice. Well, people think they can't get caught because it's on the Internet. So they create a web of email addresses and they create their own fake identities to do it. But ultimately, there's always that digital footprint that they leave. They just and, and it's it's a faceless crime. So if I run up to some little old lady on the street and I steal her purse, I'm seeing myself doing that. And I'm probably feeling a little remorseful. Hey, I knocked this little old lady over. I stole her purse. All her stuff was in it. You know, she's very upset. If I'm doing it on the Internet. It might be the same little old lady that's a victim. I don't care. I'm not seeing her suffer. 
what you're saying, though, is true. Because it's digital, there might be a footprint, but I have to tell you, these people go on the internet and create these products, these clickbait ads. It'll say, you know, Dr. Phil revolutionary product or Dr. Phil and Robin. And there'll be something there that says, you know, CBS upset over Dr. Phil and Robin creating this great product or something. People go like, what's that about? They click on it and they get in there and they still say the most powerful words in advertising are free and new and improved. And so it'll say, okay, here's a free product that'll remove all your wrinkles. And it's got nothing to do with me. It's got nothing to do with Robin. It says, this is free, but you have to give us your credit card information in case you want to start buying it. But the first month is free. And then you can never cancel because you can't find them. You can click the cancel button. They don't respond. Seriously, I want to find these people for marketing purposes. They have the best market penetration I've ever seen. This is tens of millions of dollars. But poor folks, a lot of times, are on fixed income, and they start hitting their bank account for $78 a month that they can ill afford, and they can't get it stopped. Xavier, what's your view on this? Yeah, Dr. Phil, these scams mimic real products. Because you talked about the trial period where then you give your credit card number and then you get billed after a certain period of time. Well, many of streaming services, many other products do this where you have to give a a number and then after a period of time, you will be billed. Uh, Many of delivery services do that as well. So people are used to doing some of these activities in terms of engaging in perfectly legal activities. But then these uh, scammers are maybe using SEO in terms of connecting with Dr. Phil and then it attaching to something that's fraudulent. So the the hair regeneration stuff I bought that had your name attached to it. Is yeah, not, I use it. Yeah, <laughs> it's not gonna I work. use it. What's that tell you about it? It doesn't work a damn bit. But we had a scam one time where people actually created a phone number for Paramount Studios, and it says, if you want a personal appointment with Dr. Phil or Robin, call this number. They created a phone number, and you call the number, and they answer it. It says, executive producer, Dr. Phil. So I want to make an appointment. And they said, well, okay, but you have to pay in advance. And they'd tell them Western Union or whatever, and people would fall for it. What really hurt my feelings is it was like $350 for an appointment with Dr. Phil or 400 for an appointment with Robin. <laughs> I kid you not. And so we actually traced them, found them. They were working out of Houston. We flew down there and these were people that would also do fortune telling and stuff like that. So we set up an appointment to have a fortune telling with them. We sent them the money, found it was the same people and confronted them in this hotel room in Houston, I'm telling you, they scattered like a jailbreak. They were going down the hall, down the stairways, in the elevator. And I got in the elevator with three of them with a camera crew. It was the slowest elevator in the world. We went down 18 floors with these people, and they were just dying. But nobody wants to prosecute them. They don't. And that's part of the issue. It's become so widespread and so commonplace that honestly, our legal system can't keep up with the number of fraudulent cases. Literally just last week, my mother showed me a letter. She said, is this real or not? Because she's gotten scammed so many times. And they were telling her that her accounts had been compromised Mm -hmm. and that she needs to apply for this credit reporting system. And they were allegedly saying it was a department store account. I call the department store corporate office. It's completely bogus. But the fact, my mother's 70, and she said, you know, she's not sure. She can't tell the fake from the real. And when there, you- There's the title insurance now. I hear the ads on, on TV. Impressive. And, and I hear the ads on TV. Uh, your title, your deed to your house could be stolen and therefore, you know, send us and it's some fee and, and a praise on elderly bill. <clears throat> and it gets advertised on TV. How could the deed to your house get stolen and someone else all of a sudden own your house? And anyway, you have insurance for that already. Using you, Dr. Phil, though, as 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 a placeholder for that, that puts additional pressure on you to protect your reputation. Your oh, my God. You have no idea. They sell CBD oil and stuff wow. with my name. Dr. Oz and I are doing a product. Oprah and I are doing a product. 
And I mean, we've sent out hundreds of cease and desist letters to these companies. And when we get close, they shut down, get a new carpet charter, go across the street and open up again. It's like stomping ants. You cannot get them shut down. Because there's no flag system. You, 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 you started this fraudulent company, then you shut it down, you open another. There isn't a system in place that prevents people from continuing to do that. So, so let me tell you what happened in Chicago, since we're Chicago themed today. The uh, Zoom court, right? So they had Zoom bond court during COVID. Everything's on Zoom. There were people who were on Zoom bond, bond court and would chat in the chat feature. People would say, do you need a lawyer to represent someone for court today? And the family member would say, yes, you know, send me, sell me, whatever it was, $250 and I'll represent them for bond court. And then, of course, bond court would come on and, and there'd be no one representing them. And they would do it and they would get, because the bond court started a different time and it was untraceable. They, they would make, you know, $1,000 for doing nothing at bond court. Yeah, I worked in the jewelry industry a lifetime ago, and we just got it beat into us all the time. If it's too good to be true, it is, and don't be too nice. And we ended up having to stop. Like People would come in, and they wanted to just buy our box. And we'd usually give it to them because it was a, some young kid or something that wanted to give something to his girlfriend that he bought out of wherever. And we had people were trying to return engagement rings that they had bought or women coming to return an engagement ring that they got from us in our box. And I just think with, with the way technology is, it's those people times a million because they've just been empowered to do these things. What do you think's going on with these people? Like this Sherry Papini, you guys have all seen this story. She disappeared from her husband and family on November 2nd of 2016. Reportedly, she's out jogging a mile from her home in Redding, California. And then she reappears three weeks later. She claims she was kidnapped by two Hispanic women. And then four years later in 2020, she's charged with it being a scam, that she had actually been off with her boyfriend or something. Now, clearly a scam, but not after money. I mean, there wasn't a big ransom paid. And I've always said there are different kinds of currency. Jesse Smollett. It wasn't about getting a bunch of money. That was about something else, fame, notoriety, sympathy, whatever. Papini, she disappeared for three weeks, then reappears. You know, psychologically, there's social currency, fame, fortune is maybe further down the road from them. When these people get caught, should they be prosecuted? Should they be jailed? Because they didn't steal money, but they absorbed resources and all. Should they be prosecuted? What should happen to them? Tracy? I'm, I'm uh, <coughs> reluctant to say that because I think we prosecute way too many people for things. But I think there's, you know, obviously we need some research into what motivates this and then what will stop it. Right. Because some of these scammers, I think to some extent, just won't stop. And if that's the case, then I don't know what else we have but prosecuting them, right? Because they're just going to keep racking up victims. So I have to put my law professor hat on. You know, I always encourage my students to come up with a solution. And I think a helpful solution to addressing it is to create a law specifically to address these types of crimes uh, and, have, and have different layers. If you, you know, you get one bite at the apple to make a mistake. But when you see these repeat offenders, I do think, yes, we need to prosecute them. That that's how our system is set up because that's how you deter that type of behavior. And the fact that, you know, someone like Dr. Phil's, his brand, you work years to build your brand and have some scam artists, you know, scamming your fans, I think is outrageous. And I think that because they know there's not that level of accountability, that's why they keep doing so, it. So you would have a one free scam rule? <laughs> is I would, that what you're I, saying? I would have an alternative sentencing rule for people but that have not but done you've got that. Harm. So, so people keep confusing in all this. And again, we, you just mentioned people keep confusing whether people should be prosecuted. And you have to. And I'm a criminal defense lawyer, so, so you know I, yes. I advocate for people all the time. Uh, people should be prosecuted because, unfortunately, that's the way that you keep order in society. And otherwise, there's just a complete lack of respect. But What's the punishment? And those are two totally different questions. It's like the, saying the question, should people be prosecuted and should there be cash bail? They're two totally different I mean, questions. To, well, to that point, Steve, we, Dr. Phil introduced the, set, the, the, parts of the part of the segment talking about someone scamming for clout versus scamming for money. 
And the the level of whether you rise to a misdemeanor or a felony depends on how much money you steal. And so, I mean, we we do have a sentencing process to how much right. do people steal. We do have to, to address that as well. Well, I think one of the one of the problems here that we're underlying is that there's also a total lack of the ability to get mental health treatment in the U.S., um, where some of these people who are scamming for clout probably fall into that realm where they you could have a criminal justice response that also has the ability to intervene that way Absolutely. to get them their help before putting away. And I kind of differentiate these people scamming for clout and these people using Dr. Phil's likeness yeah. to sell CBD because that is probably the 50th thing they've done. So mm -hmm. those are like serious longtime offenders who aren't going to stop. Mm -hmm. And even the person who doesn't like the criminal justice system wants it smaller. Those people have to be Look, prosecuted. Stealing is, stealing is a much easier way to support yourself than working hard. Oh yeah. So people, you know, people steal. They do, and it's a shame because a lot of the scammers, as Dr. Phil said, they're some, and they're smart, they're sophisticated scams that if they just found the right avenue yeah. on a Madison Avenue into the advertising group, you know, community, they could actually make money legitimately, probably support themselves really well. Some of it that's really bothering me is getting super dangerous because right now these scams are selling fake pills on the internet, and so many of them are laced with. Well, there's two ends of the continuum. So many of them are laced with fentanyl, lethal doses of fentanyl, to the point that you go on Snapchat and you buy what you think is oxycotton or oxycodone, which you shouldn't be doing anyway without a prescription, but you can, and they'll deliver it to your house. It's like Postmates or <laughs> Uber, whatever. They'll deliver the pills to your house and they're laced with fentanyl. I've had a show recently with five sets of parents on, all of their kids had purchased a pill on Snapchat, got it, and died. And one of them took a quarter of a pill. One quarter, they broke it up, took a quarter of it, and were dead by morning. It, I mean, that is, is, is challenging because you have to have the social media platform to police itself from yeah. content that may be harmful, harmful to the users, particularly if they're underage or uh, if you're talking about parents uh, lamenting the the loss of their their child, that's just that's just a pain I, I just couldn't wouldn't wish on anyone. Yeah, and the other end of it is some cancer patients or whatever are buying pills that they can't afford, so they buy them on the internet and they either have nothing in them at all, or they've been stolen from a legitimate store and put into a truck that got up to 130 or 140 degrees in the summer, sitting in the south somewhere, deactivated the active ingredients. And so the pill is either degraded so much that they're getting a percentage of the treatment or no treatment whatsoever. And so they pay 25% of what it would cost at the pharmacy, but they're getting little or no treatment and they wind up dying because they think they're getting chemo and they're not. But this is a product of, of technology as much as anything. The internet has made it easier to get the news. The internet has made it easier to find a date. The internet has made it easier to, to do a scam on people. I mean, all of it is instantaneous now. Something goes through these people's minds. I call them keyboard bullies when we're talking about cyberbullying because there are certain things when you are removed from the personal contact. It's like road rage. You'll yell and scream things in your car when somebody cuts you off that you wouldn't say to them if they were standing next to you in an elevator. Right. But you're in a car, yeah, okay, you call them every name in the book because there's that anonymity. And when you're on a keyboard, you don't see Mrs. Jenkins wasting away because you sold her an inert substance. How do we stop that? I think there are categories of scammers and con men. And I just interviewed Anna Delvey last week, the making of Anna on Netflix. I guarantee you she has no remorse, no idea in her mind that she's done anything wrong whatsoever because she justifies this by saying, okay, yes, I misrepresented things to the bank. Yes, I said I had assets I didn't have. Yes, I signed false documents. However, but. but 
I believed this was all going to work out before any of this came due and all would be forgiven. They justified. And I believe she really believed I'm going to be such a success before any of this comes due. It'll all be paid back and everything will be forgiven. Nobody will care. But you saw that, that about the, the Tinder swindler, the the other documentary where you had this this gentleman, he was using money from one woman to pay another woman to to to, to, to gallivant around the world. Right. And now he's selling uh, uh, informationals about how to be as successful as he is now. How and, is that any different, though, than a gambler who says... The next, the next, you know, I'm just going to put my my next dollar in. It's going to turn around. It's going to turn around. It's going to turn around. Well, it's what his she's dollar. doing, but it's, right. it's, it's, it's his dollar. money, not other people. He's gambling with other people's money. Exactly. But I'm saying that the the Spoken psychology. Spoken like a defense lawyer. <laughs> the psychology of it, though, right, of Steve, doing it. Preach on, brother. <laughs> as, yeah, the psychology of doing it. So these people who are doing these scams, if they weren't doing these scams, they'd, they'd be, be doing, doing something, something else. else. Yeah. It's just it's just the way they. They are, and this is the easiest way to do it. Because but people of that have been scamming. Look at Madoff. Madoff started out scamming with a pencil and paper and a ledger. I mean, that's what he did. Well, some of these you people know, have probably been scamming for a lot of times. They've tried various mechanisms to scam other people, and and they found a mechanism that works. And you saw your 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 guest Anna. She is not remorseful at all. She feels as if this is part of her business model. Right. If I, if I in, until I get caught, I'm going to keep doing it. And now she's got more attention. She and can it, make more money in a legitimate way. Uh, now using the scam that she created. So in her mind, it was successful. Isn't that the essence of of really the criminal mind at the end of the day, Doctor Phil? And you would, you know, I'm sure you've analyzed this before, but that they think there is a reason to do it whether it's a business decision or a personal decision, in their mind, someone who's, who's doing wrong can always justify it in their mind. A criminal is always going to be detached from, from the process in terms of and, and how they, in terms of what it, the cost is to themselves and the cost to other people's lives. I've seen two categories, and you guys tell me what you've encountered in terms of prosecuting and defending these people, but I've seen two basic categories. One is people that ease into it. Like they start out and they say, okay, I'm going to fudge these financials a little bit. I'm like, they want to know what this asset's worth. I'm going to give myself benefit of the doubt here. I'm going to fluff this up a little bit. It works and nobody says anything. You know, they say, what's this building worth? And you might think it's worth 200000 and they say 225 And so they take that 25 extra and they, they go, hey, you know, that worked out okay. And so... Nothing happened. Nobody was hurt. Everything went okay. The lie just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And before you know it, they go to their friends and say, hey, will you help me out here? Will you say that you are buying this house or will you do this or you do that? And the friend doesn't think they're destabilizing the economy. They think they're helping Steve. So they say, yeah, okay, you know, I'm your friend, I'll do it. They don't realize that they've just committed fraud when they signed this document to a federal lending institution. They just think they're helping their friend. You've gotten sucked into it. So they start out small, and before you know it, they've got 40 or 50 loans. It's Bernie Madoff. So you ask them, didn't you realize that at some point this was going to hit the wall? And the answer I found is no. They never actually projected forward and thought the day's going to come when this is going to all come due and hit the wall. They keep thinking there's going to be one more iteration, one more thing that's going to get me past this. So that's one side that thinks that they just ease into it and then it just gets bigger and bigger. The longer you chew it, the bigger it gets. Then the other category is the narcissist that thinks the law just doesn't apply to them, that they're Anna Delvey, they're the type that thinks I'm so important, I'm so talented, I'm so big that I fly above the rules. I fly above everything. I can do what I want. It doesn't matter. Nobody's ever going to hit me. I'm good to go. Listening to you, it made me think of the guy at WeWork. Right. right? That he just it kept growing and he kept lying about it and he didn't have to worry. And at some point he even got a Wall Street to approve the IPO. I mean, that's how big it got. 
And then it wasn't days away from that IPO that it all started collapsing because people finally started looking behind the behind the scam. And all of a sudden, people realized there was nothing there. I think it's it's common to see the first example where people think keep thinking the next time I'll stop after the next time, almost like a form of an addiction. And they think they're invincible and it, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger. They look up and then they, what I typically hear them say is I was in too deep at this point. It was I was too many people were involved for me to, to turn it around or to stop. And so I still think that because the Internet creates such a platform for these types of things to grow expeditiously, very quickly. You know, we as a community have to do more community policing on the Internet, meaning, as they say, see something, say something. A lot of times I see scams and I, I don't necessarily report every scam that I see. And that's someone with the legal training that I have. And I think that we have to be reconditioned to as we do with bullying. If you see something, say something. Well, we've seen in several instances, major documentaries that are getting a lot of attention, the most viewed. It seems to capture the attention. and just better than scripted television. And so we are rewarding people who are scamming and saying, hey, you'll get your own documentary too. You'll get your own Netflix special about you too. You get a chance to sell whatever you need to sell and, and profit your wares. And then the next person gets a chance to go to Snapchat and to the Instagram and to Twitter and whatever and scam other people as well. We call them con men. And we forget that that's short for confidence confidence game because the person comes on with huge confidence i'm from texas and so you know back in the 80s I always had people trying to sell me oil deals and they'd come in and they'd have a rolex on they'd be driving a lincoln or a cadillac i mean they dress for success everything was there the rolex wasn't real the cadillac was three payments behind mm. and they're trying to sell me an oil deal and my first question was always how much money you got? Walk me into your bank. Let me talk to your banker. That's when the show Dallas was on. Yeah. They talk like they got all the money because all the confidence in the world, people don't ask questions. We give people the benefit of the doubt without asking questions. Because we want to believe that people are honest and we want to believe that people we're dealing with, we can trust them. But at some point, you know, some of these scams uh, are just... You just shake your head at how people could do it. I, I'm representing someone now and uh, the alleged scam that he was running. And, and there's there's a number of these. Everyone's doing the same thing. Everyone hasn't gotten caught yet. Um, retired military who use Navy federal credit sends out uh, emails saying, you know, this is Navy federal credit. You need to give us your information. We've determined that you need this loan, blah, blah. And people would get these loans but the loans would get paid, the checks would get paid to, to the scammers. Now, why is someone taking out a loan and having the check paid to someone else? You have to wonder what, what is going on in someone's mind where they're getting a solicitation and signing for a loan to go to someone else that they don't know with the promise that they're gonna pay the but money back. But you made back. a good point when you said that you know, people, we want to believe in people's honesty, mm -hmm. but right. the way we process information, we all make assumptions. We, when we walk in this room, we made assumptions. You know, when I first saw, saw Xavier, I made assumptions based on his appearance. And mm -hmm. so these scammers are very keen on that. The products they serve, they make it look like Dr. Phil quality when they're putting forth these products. And so I don't know well, if it's so much as, I think the scam is the art of it as well, meaning it's preying on how we process information, how we make assumptions, how we you know, how we make decisions it's based a, on it's, it's, it's a confidence game. Yes. Right, but as a criminal defense lawyer, I always think that the biggest scam is that someone raises their hand, swears to tell the truth, and they're actually going to tell the truth. And people think, well, they, they swore to tell the truth because they're the same people who we think are lying about what originally happened. So if they get up there and they tell the same story, they're still lying. And, and really, why does that change? If you're an inherently bad person, the, you That's know, or different. You have the legal person. training to know but, that. Yeah. My mother, my seven-year-old mother is not going to know that. She's going to believe you. Your 78-year-old mom is not going to know that. But as a society, we think that just that act of walking in a courtroom and raising your hand, you know, on, on a Bible, some non-religious person, you're raising their hand on a Bible, somehow going to make them truthful. Yeah, there's plenty and of... And it's not. Yeah, so we yeah, like to plenty believe... Of there's plenty of juries are that, that don't believe... But, but we like... That, that's why you, that's, you say you defend, have a criminal defendant. That's why you tell them don't take the stand because the jury might not believe you. So it's all about the confidence game that con men are able to win. 
So they're able to connect with what relates to you. They they have a profile of who they're speaking with. They have their information about them. They know a lot about them, and they're able to do that. Right. I, had, I, had a, I had a client recently call me and, and walk me through a, a company saying that she had taken out almost 10 credit cards. And in, in her brain, she's like, oh, what did I do? And she's thinking and they're praying on this person, thinking that something is wrong, this urgency. And that, that's also attached to the con. Give me your number now. Give it now. Mm-hmm. Well, what are the signs? I mean, we need to tell people because you guys know, you see this all the time from a legal point of view. What are the signs? Because I always tell people, one, for example, places like the government, the IRS, they don't call you. They don't. <laughs> they do not call phone. you. My mother was called and she called me and said, the IRS called. No, they didn't. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I didn't even finish the sentence. So the IRS called and said, I owe $2,300. No, they didn't. The IRS does not call you. That's the first thing, right? If they call and say, hey, listen, they're getting ready to garnish your bank accounts. They're getting ready to seize all your... No, that's not true. They don't call, right? That's a big warning sign. Government agencies don't call and demand money over the phone. And right now and tell you to go send a money order. That should be a big red flag. That should be like a Navy flagman on the end of the deck, right? Waving at you. That's a big red flag, true? Yeah, absolutely. They don't threaten to arrest you either. And this, uh, another client talked to me about her being threatened to be arrested. I said, if they were going to arrest you, they'd be right. at your door. They're not threatening There's you. There's a DEA scam that's yeah. going on where they, where the, it's, it's been going on for, for at least a decade now where people get a call from, the, hey, we're with the DEA and you've been buying illegal drugs. And some of the people, you know, the, the law of averages, right? Some people say, I haven't been buying any drugs at all. But some people are either buying illegal drugs or they're buying drugs, you know, legitimately, but now they're scared. And, you know, you have to send this much money is a, is a civil penalty or we're going to arrest yeah. you. That's been going on for years. Right. right. I think the best advice I would give is, number one, if it looks too, too good to be true, it's yeah. probably true. Trust your instincts. People ignore their instincts and say, you know, I knew something was off. Trust your instincts. And I think it's also important to make sure if they're asking you to transfer your, any account numbers, if someone's calling you, cold calling you and asking you for your account number or to transfer funds anywhere, those are huge red flags. And again, my mother's been scammed a million times, a bank calling, allegedly her bank saying someone's they need to lock her account down. It's been compromised. We need your account number. And so I think those are three major red flags, as you would say, to look out for. And I think also you, these same scammers, ask them for their information. A ask ways to verify them. And when you start asking questions about verifying them, and then they, they'll start to back off. They, they don't want to, to get their information. They don't want a legitimate email attached to a company that you can actually research and look at. That's the sign. That's where you hear the like, click. Click. Right. Ask <laughs> or a question. if they have a foreign accent. A real thick foreign accent, and they say they're from the IRS. Yeah, the that's IRS, probably the IRS knocks. <laughs> that's what they do. They don't. That's, call. that's the language they use. Right. Yeah. Knock on the door. <laughs> and scammers pressure you to act immediately. You know, you got to act on this right now. I get. I'm on someone's list for car insurance, and how? No, it's like insurance. Even though we got done with the payments, so a car that got totaled in an accident many years ago now and is gone. But like every six months, we're contacted by email and mail. They're just hard after us on this scam related to our old car that's three or four years, you know, four years gone from us. But it's hardcore, and they just keep, this is five years now, they just keep coming after us for this. And yeah, it's that time like, is important. Act now. If you are put in a position, particularly if you are of a vulnerable population like senior citizens, the, the, your give up personal information right now, the intense pressure on them. And a lot of, you don't see a lot of senior citizens committing crimes. And so in their brain, they, they want to be able to protect themselves from if they unfortunately did something that that they accidentally maybe was illegal. And so that timing element, pushing you to do something in that moment is one of the biggest elements of why scams work. That's a big, big flag. And what worries me is mail fraud. I've seen, and I've got examples of them, letters that they don't look like IRS letterhead. They've actually taken the IRS letterhead and put it on a letter and sent it. It's the IRS letterhead. They've hijacked it and put it on a letter. So you look at it and go, go on the website. Well, hell, that's the IRS letterhead. If it's an organization you know, 
but the promise, the demand, or the problem doesn't sound right, then you've got to get personal contact, right? You've got to call somebody and say, hey, I got a letter here. Is this a department? Is this a request that you guys would make or whatever? And you get stuck in voice jail, but you <laughs> got to you got to figure something out. <laughs> right. I mean, this is a multi-billion dollar problem. You also have to think about the extensions that some of the websites may be used. It looks like the IRS, it's IRS dot another extension, not gov. It's it's this lookalike website that may be able phishing your information as well. What about these debt collection scams with these people calling to say, you owe money and you pay us this, we're going to forgive that because they have somehow gotten a hold of somebody's numbers, they've hacked in, they've bought something, and they know what people owe. How do people protect themselves from that? What do you recommend people do when they get somebody calling saying, you owe 2000 pay us $500, we will wipe your debt out? The Federal Trade Commission allows for uh, individuals to get one free copy of their, of their credit report. So you, you want to be able to get that, and then you want to call those credit agencies and get uh, a full copy of your credit report, walk yourself through it, see what's on there, and find the, the, the verify the accuracy and call the different uh, the companies that are there to, to verify the debt. I mean, that's important because there are rules that protect consumers in that, in that right. case. If, if someone calls and says, you know, hey, we'll forgive your your $5,000 for $1,000 after you get past the initial shock of it sounds too good to be true, <laughs> as as she said, uh, then, uh, then I think you want to call the actual company that you owe the debt to. Just... All people have to do to prevent getting scammed when they get a call is say, give me your number. Let me call you back. I'm, I'll call you back in five minutes. Do your homework. Yeah, that's I, it. I support, do your homework. I support what you it. said because a lot yeah. of times before it hits your credit report, there's like a 30-day or 60-day window. And so it may not show up and it might be legit. And so I think it's important to go straight to the source. That's always going to be my advice to any client. You go straight to the source. If it's a certain department store, call that department store. And they'll say, this is the credit bureau or the credit collection company that we use, and you call them directly. One of the ones I've seen recently that was shocking to me, but we had a couple on the show, is the parent slash grandparent scam. You talk about lazy scammers, but they get the number, how they get it, I don't know. But they get the number and they call up and say, Grandma, do you know who this is? Like it's playing the game and they say well is this karen or carol yes it's carol okay now they know she's got a granddaughter named carol then she says i'm in so much trouble i've got to have five hundred dollars i'm going to go to jail please don't tell mom can you send me five hundred dollars by western union please don't tell my parents they'll kill me Honest to God, this is going like wildfire. And the couple that we had on, someone called them, got the daughter's name, and said, we have your daughter. And she couldn't reach the husband. And they were demanding $10,000 right now, or they're going to kill the daughter. And she couldn't reach the husband. He was on a flight. Fortunately, She contacted a friend who said, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. They actually got the daughter out of class at school and verified that she was A-OK. But they wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't paying off. If it's Mm -hmm. one out of 100 times, then you've got $10,000, and they're running these on phone banks. If you're making $500 a day doing it. You get yeah. one person to take five hundred dollars a day, five day work week. Yeah, that's you're making six figures now. Once again, they are playing on urgency. They are playing on people's fears, um, things that are close and personal to them, and maximizing that to be able to gain confidence in that moment that is legitimate, and then transferring that into um, to the scams that they're doing on people. I think we're saying it real clear. You've got to talk to the source. You can't give in to the pressure. Because time pressure is what's getting people to pull the trigger, right? Exactly. That's the time pressure. It's, it's you must do this now. It is, and it doesn't matter what the act is. Pay this money. Get this person free. Uh, do this. Do that. And it's right now. Act immediately. Because they know that 
if that is that call is done, well, they, they'll move on to the next call. But they will try to maximize the urgency of that moment as much as possible. To and also they're, the they're maximizing it because, Xavier, they want to make sure that you don't call your daughter or your son. Exactly. Right. right. Or your neighbor or your friend who's in a, you know, to, to, to verify the legitimacy of it. So that's also part of the scam before they, you know, in terms of their credibility being compromised. Right. You look, you look at anything, they're, they're always preying on the urgency. You go to buy a car and the dealership you know, knows example. once you walk out, yeah. you're Perfect probably example. not going to buy the car. You go to buy a timeshare, yeah. go to a timeshare sales thing and, and they put all the pressure on you. And then, cause they know you aren't going to call up later and say, I want the timeshare. So this is no different. They're, they're, you got to strike when, when the iron's hot. It's a different form of sales. I mean, you, any type of sales training, people have one and they have multiple rebuttals until it gets to the end when they're gone. Scams are working the same way. Well, one of the things that I am stunned by are these romance scams out of Nigeria. We do the catfish shows about these people, and I thought I had seen it all until recently I had a woman on that was convinced that this was the love of her life. Two years, never met him, never done a FaceTime with him, hadn't done a phone call with him. It was all text, and she had sent him about $300,000. I had her on the show. He had stolen these pictures from somebody. She only had six pictures. And he was sending all these love letters and stuff like that. I found the guy whose pictures were stolen, had him on satellite so she could see the real person, said, I'm so sorry, that's not me. I had my pictures stolen. Said, you see the guy, all these documents he had sent, he was stuck in Africa and construction site had been robbed on the way to the airport excuse after excuse after excuse she said oh my god i feel so stupid she left the show the guy started talking to her again she sold her house and sent him the money wow. after the show after, after i introduced him on satellite that it wasn't him and she sold her house and sent him the money to come meet her. He didn't show. She came back on the show, still believing he was real. I brought the real guy in from North Carolina. She only had six pictures. We brought the six shirts he was in the pictures in, showed her him and the six shirts, and let her meet him in person. And she now swears she totally believes it this time. But here's this woman that worked 30 years, Gave him all of her money, sold her house, gave him all the money, has nowhere to live, totally broke. But I don't, that, that doesn't sound like, that sounds like it started out as a scam and, it, and there might be some issues that, that she has. If you right. had her on and she knew it wasn't, you know, it wasn't real. The key is romance. Yeah, you just, you, the key is romance because the, 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 the center of romance, people want this fairy tale life. And the person that's on the ro romance scam, they're utilizing these fancies, this fa fantasy and taking advantage of that. The person is, is, is conjuring in their mind all these different scenarios. And so even when they're presented with the fact that it isn't true, what they're doing is going along. This is part of the romance, the, the adventure, the intrigue. Oh, wow, now it's Dr. Phil is involved. They even brought another guy with pictures. This is all playing into the element of excitement that's with romance. And also, they always promise when I come, I'm coming with millions. That's why, they, but they, I, I've got millions, but I need your money to get I the need millions. Your money to get right. the millions. Listen, I'm stuck here. I just have to pay the tax. I have to pay the levy. I have to do this or that. And then I'm going to come with $10 million. I'm 30 years younger than you. And I'm just crazy in love with you. I'm going to take care of you the rest of my life. It's interesting. I've asked these guys, they use this broken English in their text, you know, because they're from Nigeria and they say they're from Omaha and they say, I, I, I love you like sun, moon. The Reverend Sun Moon? No. Yeah. <laughs> You're my everything. It's just broken English. I say, I've talked to some of these scammers and I've said, you've got grammar check and spell check just like we do. Why do you not do that? And they said, oh, that's a screening device. 
if they're willing to overlook that, we know we have a live one. Which mm. makes sense. And just as the only female at the table, um, they are selling fantasies. And just as women, you know, we are taught by society the fairy tales. We see a princess, we see a castle. And so that romanticizing whatever relationship they're offering us, it is very appealing. It's very enticing. So when you find someone that's longing uh, to be loved, to be quite honest, it it from the outside looking in, we do look crazy. Now, not crazy. I don't like to use that word. We look um, unreasonable, right? Like, why why can't you see the obvious? They can't even text in English. But that longing to be loved and to be cared for, as they're promising, it's part of how we're conditioned as women. Listen to those who really love you. Listen to those you know that are around you. Well, guys, this is so insightful. You know, to have all of this brain power around the table talking about this is invaluable to my listeners. And also, thank you for everything on the show today. I thought we really talked about that in depth. I thought it was balanced and intelligent. And I'm an old white guy talking <laughs> about it, but I tried to be very balanced you and were. give you are, covered. You were. You were. You're very you give, empathetic, I thought, was very as well. So. Very empathetic. Thank you guys thank so you much. I hope you'll come back another time. Thank you. Please have us back. I really appreciate it.